Hey guys, welcome to Brain Electric. Recently, Bloomberg Quick Take dropped this video. Kernel founder Brian Johnson finally gets around to stating that their goal is to move forward with measurement. We believe the most promising potential of these interfaces is measurement. I also reached out to Neurosity founder Alex Castillo, who mentioned that they're also going in the direction of attention due to market demand. And then this wearable company, Neurable, announced that their upcoming product, Entin, is available for pre-order. Instead of the helmet design, they went ahead and built their dry electrodes into a rather swanky looking headphone design. We're at an interesting moment because it seems like all within a span of a couple months, these non-invasive companies have all announced something similar, that they're going in the direction of attention. Brian Johnson went on to Lex's show not long ago and brought with him a Kernel helmet, otherwise known as Kernel Flow, their product, to try it out. Lex responds saying that it's fascinating to have a piece of tech that you feel like knows you more intimately than our devices have in the past, and that this real-time measurement feature genuinely feels useful. Brian Johnson is an interesting guy. He stays kind of surface level with a lot of stuff, but every once in a while he'll drop a soundbite like this. It's remarkable, it's almost like we live in this wild, wild west of unquantified communications within ourselves and between each other when everything else has been grounded. I mean, for example, I know if, if I buy an appliance at the, at the store or on a, on a website, I don't need to look at the measurements on the appliance to make sure it can fit through my door. That's an engineered system of appliance manufacturing and, and construction. Everyone's agreed upon engineering standards. And we don't have engineering standards around cognition. It's not a for, it has not entered as a formal engineering discipline that enables us to scaffold in society with everything else we're doing, including consuming news, our relationships, politics, economics, education, all the above. Which starts to, you know, bring up all these ideas and exciting thought experiments. But then the conversation just kind of circles back to attention measurement. I feel a bit skeptical of this because in a way, it feels like Apple Watch notifications 2.0. The thing he says about fMRI costing thousands, but these devices, well, I'm sure the helmet will also cost thousands, so 50 grand. But yeah, from almost like a Theranos-esque perspective of the idea of having a at-home daily neuroimaging device, Mary Lou Jepsen talks about this a lot. It's exciting. But my hot take is that these notifications will be very helpful initially after you purchase the headset, but then will soon be forgotten. Just like Apple Watch notifications telling you to stand up and when to go to bed, having Entin or the Kernel Flow helmet tell you, okay, now you're focused and you should do this thing, Okay, now you're not focused, go and do this thing instead of that thing. I think it'll be amazing for like a month. But what happens when you habituate to this and the novelty wears off? Even say with getting LASIK, the novelty does in fact wear off. But then maybe Brian might say, well, your actual behavior has now changed for the better. I don't know, I just don't think that is that cool, frankly. It's like hustle culture and deep work, deep focus. I gotta say, man, sometimes I have a day where I'm focused and I get things done and days where I'm totally unfocused and don't get anything done. But the difference between those states, to me at least, doesn't seem nearly as profound as it's being made out to be recently. I don't know. I think we just get in the weeds with these conversations about focus and it's almost like we're thinking too small, you know? If you are going to habituate to something, what is the coolest thing you could habituate to? Okay, focus notifications keep you feeling less distracted. But what is a tool that literally increases your productivity. My mind goes back to device interaction. So neither Intin or Kernel will use software that allows us to interact with and or control our devices. It's a read-only device, at least in the first products that are rolling out. So Next Minds, however, is slightly different. I don't know why they chose to just like tease cursor control in some third-party app. In Neurable's first VR demos, you could also select virtual objects. Or in Neurosity's Notion product, there was a think to scroll feature that they showed. So again, I'm not sure why they'd put the effort into giving you control over virtual objects, but not a virtual cursor to simply interact with your actual device, whether it's your PC or your phone. If you look down at your Bluetooth mouse, if you use one, you realize that what controls the cursor is the hardware in this device. You know, so I'm assuming that there were perhaps complications in building hardware and software that fit together in one wearable BCI headset such that the mouse hardware is now interacting with the EEG hardware, I'm not sure. If you Google non-invasive BCI cursor control, not much pops up, nothing recently at least. You can see people have clearly thought about this, but it's not clear why things haven't come to fruition. With NextMind's developer kit, you can interact in these ways, but only using apps that you built in Unity or in the demos. So there's something missing here, either on the hardware side or software side or both. I reached out to NextMind about this. They mentioned they're going the same route as Oculus with their SDK. Quote, working with developers is the best way to grow BCI apps. See, I don't think initially the move to create, quote, BCI apps from scratch 
is the right play. I think letting us interact with apps we already use is the right play. That's how you get people to use your device right away from day one. Waiting for Adobe, say, to make a BCI version of Adobe Premiere is like not on their radar, you know? To me, this feels similar to how Magic Leap wanted to create AR apps. And we all know how that story ended. It seems like you don't need a killer app per se. You just need something we can actually use. Magic Leap teased the magic verse, everything AR. But if you can do everything, you can do nothing. Apple's AR glasses, on the other hand, seem practical, usable. Even something as quote simple as cursor control with an EEG or ECOG headset would be something actually worth purchasing because it at least simulates the early functionality of Neuralink's N1. Even if the latency is high, I mean, I think of other products we purchase that are almost like proof of concepts for later versions. Oculus Rift, for sure. Especially if you're not a gamer, there really just ain't much to do in VR, you know. You just want to dabble, see what it could be like. Developers could start running through the experiments needed from a programming perspective to start thinking more directly about application interaction. Because again, cursor control is cool, but even the quote zero latency cursor control we have in the mice we currently use every day, that's still kind of slow, you know. So in Neuralink's upcoming clinical trials, they're implanting 10 disabled patients with N1 chips, which will allow them to interact with their computers and devices via Bluetooth. N1 appears as a Bluetooth device that you can pair with both your mobile phone and then your computer. It shows up like a Bluetooth mouse or keyboard would. Granted, based on the location of where the electrodes are being implanted, you can do much more than simply control a cursor, but this is the first baby step. Taking what's already been done, what's already been shown, but showing a much higher level of precision, much lower latency. So back to non-invasive tech. If you want, you can actually kind of simulate for yourself what the BCI cursor control experience would feel like. Say you're sitting at your computer using your mouse. Just kind of raise your t-shirt up over your nose a bit and remove your hand and mouse from your visual field. Now try to shift your focus away from your arm and hand and just put it fully on your cursor. This little exercise is interesting because it lets you see, okay, now I've actually just added another layer of complexity in this movement chain. Once I can actually move my cursor this way, yeah, this is still kind of slow, you know? A touch screen interaction seems like it would be much quicker. So you don't have to focus to move the cursor over to select something. You just look over at the thing to select it. Or as Kate Gelman mentions here. And we type on a keyboard, right? We're not thinking about, oh, move our finger to this key and that key and this key. Uh, we are like the first couple of times we use the computer, but after that, right, you just think type the letter K. You actually don't even need to look at the location in order to select it. That's what would make BCI cursor control different than eye tracking devices, say. This think to select ability, which opens up a whole can of possibilities. Macros. Think of a G Hub as control center, where just like how with Logitech mice, you have the flexibility to program and reprogram your own custom macros. This is where things start to tailor to the individual users. Macros and meta macros, as Gelman referred to, it's not even that you're thinking the macro while looking at the particular part of the screen. You just think about that thing and then it appears or executes or whatever. With our programmable buttons, we've only got six of them on most Logitech mice. But sit back, look at your screen, and now imagine everything you do in this software or app is now a thought-driven macro. It just brings into focus what we really care about doing here, at least with early versions of this tech, interacting with applications that actually matter, not some obscure game we developed in Unity, not throwing squares at scary monsters. I remember a couple years back, people from academia joking, oh, well, why would I want to get neurosurgery so I can scroll through Twitter faster? And I would definitely roll my eyes at that statement then. But now, I don't know, I somewhat agree, actually. Interaction with, quote, trivial apps, or maybe we shouldn't say trivial, but okay, we can say trivial. It does feel like mobile interaction for, quote, healthy patients, at least, is not it, you know. Just like the t-shirt exercise, you can kind of simulate BCI mobile device interaction by simply screen capping yourself, doing something on your phone, paying attention to your movements at each step, and then playing back that video, but now imagining that you're doing these same movements in real time via your BCI. See what I mean? It's cool, for sure. It's just not that interesting, to be honest. Or you could at least see the novelty wearing off in a couple weeks or months. That's why the 20-year timeline people seem so insistent on throwing out kind of falls apart when you do something like this because you think, God, I'm going to wait 200 freaking years so I can do this. That's why it's like with non-invasive tech, let's use this software and hardware to give us a platform to start thinking around these topics ahead of it because they might actually inform the invasive tech versus the other way around. 
So patients are getting N1 this year, but this goes back to that whole thing about humans have had cursor control via BCI for a minute. We need new ideas here. And I think we can find many of those ideas in the non-invasive tech. That's why it feels somewhat of a letdown that finally we get these announcements and it's like, it's time to stand up, cool. You're focused, you're not focused. Okay, throw something at that zombie. Think about cursor control or touch display control of desktop applications. At first you might wonder, again, if I use a particular software for work, does that software itself need to be rewritten so that I can interact with it using a BCI? Nextmind mentioned in their message BCI apps, which seems to imply like an app written from the ground up to interact with the headset. But think G-Hub here. Logitech's programmable buttons work with the software, you know, doesn't need to reinvent the wheel, just give us a decent wheel. If you start using macros and hotkeys, your workflow does become more efficient, just purely based on time analytics. Like if you don't use this macro, you have to go over there and select that tool from the menu, etc. But then back to habituating. When you spend enough years using this macro, it simply means your new normal is using this macro, this new workflow. I think lowering the latency and increasing the amount of ways in which we can use macros to interact with non-trivial apps we actually use for work to make money, that's when the stakes go up. That's when people start to get interested. So we screen capped our phones, let's screen cap our desktops and now repeat this exercise doing something. Okay, pretty cool still. So you settle into this and it becomes this meditative act like flying drones back in the day. You really had to focus on the drone not to crash it, you know? Take that same level of focus, add these mental macros. Now we have these new standards of speed and efficiency possibly arising. In gaming, you have what's known as APM, actions per minute. So perhaps this is actually what starts to popularize BCIs. We've heard sound bites here and there about a societal pressure that will arise from augmentation and those that have an implantable device, say, could potentially outpace those without one. But let's just ground that hypothetical reality into some kind of practical scenario like device interaction. If you start to see influencers or even just people in niches in the gaming world or in music or programming, design, business, whatever, and they have this device that lets them do something that you yourself would like the ability to do, just like with APM, there's something inherently interesting about speed with regards to device interaction. But again, this is where we need new ideas that can possibly come from the non-invasive wearables. It's almost like speed isn't even the thing, you know? Speed can seem trivial sometimes. A sped up time lapse of a bad song being made is still a bad song. What we need is someone to spend a week or a month prototyping even a high latency default interaction system, like how Disrupt spent a week in VR. It'd just be cool to prototype that with a non-invasive device just to see. It doesn't feel like we're any closer to being able to do that because all these non-invasive companies are dropping notification products or games, I guess. What notification are you gonna get that changes your life? Unless these notifications become sentient, I'm not seeing it. Macros and default interaction need to be experienced and tested. But what's beyond that? Conceptual telepathy. So in the launch event, Philip Sabies mentioned here, The devices that we're talking about, because of their high bandwidth and the ability to tailor the location of each individual electrode to a person's individualized cortical anatomy, we should be able to reach anywhere in motor cortex. So for example, um, there are areas um, at, the, at the base of motor cortex that are responsible for driving activation of the speech articulators. There was a recent lovely study from UCSF that um, showed uh, that from activity like that, you can actually decode uh, the speech. So you can, you can decode the movement of the articulators, and from that, you can create synthetic speech. John Donahue also described this. Even from a tiny patch of your brain, you can really orchestrate many, many different actions. That's something that, again, we've learned from science recently. Motor cortex gets you quite a bit of data. We don't just get limb activation, we get access to the speech articulators and more. The study from UCSD that Sabies references has shown a version of speech synthesis that decodes activity from essentially inner speech and outputs what a machine learning algorithm assumes the waveforms to be, and then it plays those waveforms to output the intended sentence. So let's talk about this idea of conceptual telepathy. Normally when this topic is addressed, it's always hypothetical. Imagine a day when you can dot dot dot. But let's try to approach this more empirically here. First of all, the word telepathy is probably not the best word to describe what we're talking about. The term itself was first coined in 1882 and refers to the quote, vicarious transmission of information from one person to another without using any known sensory channels or physical interaction. 
So we need a new term, obviously, because with Neuralink, we're talking about a physical device interacting with a biological organ. The interaction is certainly a physical one. But let's try to work our way up, starting with what has currently been tested and shown to actually work. And aside from animal research, I think this speech synthesis software is a good place to start. As Kate Gelman said, the company believes that they will provide the hardware platform and various apps will be provided by third-party companies and vendors to work with their hardware. So if this speech synthesis software is ported to work with N1 or future versions, it essentially works like a speech-to-text feature we can use with our phones and computers. But the key difference is that hopefully it's tuned to match the speed of inner speech. But keep in mind, again, now we're talking about speed. It's something we already do, typing and texting, etc. But with this, it could be much faster. And if it works with spatial computing, it moves us to a level two way of interacting. Like if level one is what we currently do with the tools we currently have, level two would be something that a high level non-invasive would be capable of doing. And a low latency invasive is technically already capable of doing. Step one, select your messages app by thinking about it. Step two, inner speech to text. Step three, send. Okay, level two interaction. Level two browsing, level two. It's like combining the promises of AR we've heard for years now and then the Neurable VR prototype, like in terms of selecting and interacting. You've got your Apple glasses on, and it's think to scroll, think to select, etc. So what is level three? Remove the AR interface. Let's think about brain-to-brain -brain communication. When Edison was working on a telegraphy device to send five messages simultaneously, and then Bell was like, fuck it, let's just send the voice directly down a wire, we've got Apple telling us that maybe in five years, We'll have AR glasses that we can use to read our texts as pop-up bubbles in front of us. Let's think like Bell for a second. How do we transmit and receive inner speech directly? How do we transmit and receive mental imagery directly? How do we do this with spatial, tactile, olfactory, mental content, emotional content? Introspecting on your own experience provides a lot of interesting data points that you can investigate directly. Just like when you meditate, eyes are closed. Okay, so having someone else's inner speech appear in your head. You can kind of simulate that by simply imagining that your own inner speech is someone else's that they are sending to you. You know, imagine that you're with a friend and they think to you plans of what to do later. Of course, you are thinking this thought right in this moment, obviously, but imagine it and pretend someone sent it to you. Like the sentence, what do you want to do later? Say that to yourself using your inner speech. You see how it appears instantly? Okay, so that's inner speech. Let's try mental imagery. I'm going to imagine I'm thinking something to my partner, eyes closed, picturing an image of our local park here with a question mark emoji, communicating, should we take the dogs to the park? And then she would respond, but I'll just imagine what her response would be, a thumbs up emoji, say. So I can picture that exchange in my mind's eye. I can see the images, but would she be seeing the image that I'm seeing? That's a big question here. The issue of translatability is often mentioned when this topic is brought up. And at first it seems like an unsolvable problem. Well, first of all, this thought experiment we just did, it causes you to really focus in on your mental imagery and to wonder, again, wait, what image of the park was I seeing? Literally in this moment, I'm picturing like the entrance of the park, same road we always drive down. And then there's obviously other images from the park I can recall from memory. We can also test this hypothesis of us both having similar mental imagery of the same object or scene via spoken language. Like I say, hey, you know that bench at the park? If they've seen that bench, they have a memory of it. The neuronal correlates exist somewhere in their head. So it's not necessarily having the same exact image, obviously, but something that triggers their neural correlate such that it is conversationally and contextually relevant to our interaction here. And part of what happens on the machine learning side is detecting signatures of the same signal. So over time, it gets better at predicting what to write based on what it picks up from your read. What about branching out from familiar concepts to something maybe the person you're speaking to hasn't seen before? Something that you've seen, they haven't. We have to dive deeper into dialogue specifically as it pertains to mental imagery, the motor activity of the speech articulators, and then the activity elsewhere that occurs as the human says, I am visualizing that thing. We have to find those neural correlates, and since the brain is stochastic, we have to find useful traces of them. While we're in this thought experiment, just use yourself as a test subject, Either prompt someone around you with a topic or imagine this scenario taking place. You're talking to someone before you respond to what they say or just said stop and introspect on the mental imagery that arises in your head corresponding to what you're about to say. You know, like before you say it, stop yourself, see the image, 
attempt to visualize it clearly. I know it can be really gray sometimes because these interactions just happen so quickly and feel so insanely fast and automated, but try to see it. Elon said going over radio waves, which implies that when you visualize something, the device will read, and in the head of the person you intend to think this thought to, their device will write, and vice versa. The technical challenge of developing the software has already begun. Writing has been demonstrated in animal subjects. First, we need to gather read, spike train data, using two humans who both have an N1, while they are conversing, and then experiment with, okay, Jim, repeat that sentence. Okay, now just articulate that in your inner speech. Okay, now visualize it. Okay, now Sally is gonna articulate something to you using normal speech. Then N1 reads the correlate activity of the speaker, Sally. N1 reads the correlate activity of the listener, Jim. N1 writes the activity of the speaker into the brain of the listener. Then we ask, okay, Sally, did you feel anything? Did you see anything? You see how the specific software needs to be developed just like the UCSD speech synthesis software? And again, on the machine learning side, just how the on-chip spike detection receives waveform data and pinpoints a pattern it's looking for that matches the algorithm it's been designed to employ to move a cursor. So this same system will be used to read inner speech, to read mental imagery, and then to write it, such that some form of the content is perceived by both parties. The spike train data is converted to binary, sent through the air, triggers the other BCI to write something that represents those correlates. Kind of like how radio waves trigger a speaker cone to vibrate, and this, I think, is a potential answer to the translatability problem. Different speakers might represent a song to be subtly different. Think iPhone speakers versus high-end speakers. But some form of the song shows up regardless. If I say to you, imagine you're standing on top of a large blue treehouse covered in glitter and Skittles are raining from the sky, it's almost like a way of testing the translatability problem on yourself. Have you seen that exact object before? Most likely not. If your brain constructs some form of it in real time, yeah, you'll see something. With a lot of our daily communication, I mean, just think of most of our interactions from today or this week. A lot of our dialogue with others just seems to be some kind of volley, you know? Hey, what's up? Ah, not much. Da da da, da da da. And it's kind of tricky to measure the speed of, of inner speech in that context. If I ask a question to my partner using my inner speech, it feels like it's the same or similar to the speed at which outer speech is spoken. But what does make it faster is the fact that mental imagery accompanies it and enriches it. So that's dialogue with someone else. When I articulate something to myself and I shift my focus to my inner speech, it feels as if there is some feeling of knowing the paragraph and not needing to speak the entire thing in inner speech before I, quote, get it, you know? I might leave a reference to something out because I already, quote, know what I'm referencing. That's definitely why typing feels slower than thinking in inner speech. My inner speech skips way ahead and then my fingers catch up, you know? But that's when I'm thinking to myself. If I'm to imagine thinking to someone else, the cluster thing doesn't show up, it's interesting. I don't know if this would be an emergent property though, like if two people thinking to each other would get faster and faster using references or inside jokes the same way it happens in normal spoken conversation. And if all the chip is reading is spikes, if writing those spikes in the moment where I left something out because I knew, that moment in time could perhaps also be encoded and decoded. So perhaps the recipient receiving the signal also would have that feeling that I felt in that moment, and thus also knows the reference. There's clarifications, there's repeating things, stating something differently. And if you get this thing to work, you still have to practice using it, test it out, see how effective it really is, just like any other tool. Still, just the way people talk about this is like, okay, chip in your brain, telepathy. It's like, no. Think like a neural engineer, think like a scientist. Perhaps a prototype could be developed using non-invasives. It'd be level two for sure, but it would at least start getting people more focused on this topic specifically. So say we get to level three, brain-to-brain -brain communication. How does it change us? At first, it's obvious that having this medium will deepen human communication. It's faster and more efficient than spoken language, and this can be, at least in some ways, anecdotally tested using the introspective thought experiments we talked about before. But I can't help but think about the time-lapse analogy again. A time-lapse of some random basic house still ends up being some random basic house. We develop the inner speech correlate read-write software. We can finally cut through the ambiguity in our language that creates this massive lag time in the progress of our species, but the progress towards what, you know? First, we talked about trivial smartphone apps, but what about trivial human activities in general? The ant colony will build and innovate, colonize, etc., but they'll still be ants, you know? What I wonder is like, we start with brain-to-brain -brain communication 
in which you're thinking to another human. But say eventually, finally, an interactive version of GPT-10 or whatever exists, and the way in which you interact with it is via this thought communication medium we've developed. So you're not thinking to a human, you're thinking to your OS in AGI. Like in her, we see them speaking, you know. And Theodore's interactions with Samantha are actually kind of a perfect demonstration of how surface level most of our communication is. Giving people this brain-to-brain -brain medium does not bring with it some new level of intellect or lightning bolt perspective shift on what the project of humanity is. Again, a group of engineers could build a robot faster, it makes toothpaste faster, you could have some hive mind somewhere all thinking about their favorite memories, their favorite concerts, a hive mind debating some obscure view of ethics. Peering into other humans' mental imagery is not synonymous with the singularity suddenly occurring, you know. But back to thinking to your AGI. When I mentioned earlier the thought experiment of thinking to your partner or friend or someone want to go to the park, how about thinking to your OS, how do I merge with you? The question to the OS is how do I scan the database of human knowledge and find the blueprints for self-transformation into something? Not to build the technology, but to become the technology. And your OS will scan and it might say, okay, here's where we can start.